the presentation of anarchism, anarchism. a social philosophy which aims at the emancipation, economic, social, political, and spiritual of the human race. The emancipation. Anarchist Essays is brought to you by Loughborough University's Anarchism Research Group. For more information on the ARG, see the link in the show notes or follow us on Twitter at ARGLBORO. Federico Knischnet and the Possibilities of Resistance by Tom Huyens. In October 1945, 66 German Brazilians petitioned the government of Brazil demanding that they be recognized as anti-Nazi activists, unlike their compatriots, who had sympathized with the Third Reich and were now being harassed. The lead petitioner was Friederico Knistedt, a 72-year-old German-born anarchist brushmaker and editor who had been the leading figure in the movement of anti-Nazi Germans in Brazil, in which anarchists played a major role. In this essay, we take a closer look at transnational anarchists fighting transnational militarism and fascism through the figure of Knistedt. The reason is simple, to equip ourselves to deal with the current rise of the far right in many different countries and to discover the possibilities of an anti-fascist resistance with a strong anarchist bend. Knischt had never joined any party and never committed an act of violence, yet he fought relentlessly against authoritarianism. He set out to fight the Kaiser and ended up fighting Hitler. He left his native land on the eve of the Great War only to confront the brown shirts in southern Brazil. Militants like Knistedt had to reimagine anarchist possibilities according to the new circumstances of repression and exile. They attacked authoritarianism from the right as well as the left and debated how much to collaborate with liberal groups to stem the tide of Hitlerism. German anarchists in particular fiercely countered the Nazified image of their homeland. All these ruminations are as relevant today as they were in 1933. Friedrich Knistedt was only a teenager when he became a socialist in the late 1880s, at a time when Bismarck's anti-socialist law was in full force. After 1890, when the repressive law was retired, an open socialist movement was again possible, and he continued to attend socialist meetings. As a journeyman, Knistedt veered toward anarchism, vowing to oppose centralism, authoritarianism, and militarism. He was active in the labor movement and started giving lectures, which resulted in several brushes with the law, including a nine-month prison sentence when he was 20. He read Kropotkin, Bakunin, Proudhon, Stirner, and especially Tolstoy, who remained a lifelong inspiration for his anti-militarism and opposition to state violence. Through his independent activism, he befriended the well-known anarchist Gustav Landauer and Eric Musam, who further drew him towards anarchism. As Imperial Germany ramped up its military expenditures, especially the naval race with Britain, Knistedt's activities came under increasing surveillance, which was one reason he and his family moved to Paris in 1908, where he continued anti-militarist agitation and became treasurer of an aid society for radical exiles. He also heard Rudolf Rocker speak, who had come from London. However, tensions within the movement and the discovery of spies was deeply frustrating, and Knistedt began to think of an escape from politics. In 1909, he and his family decided to join a cooperative community in the Brazilian rainforest, but this communal experience was disappointing for several reasons. Anarchist activities around anti-militarism, it turned out, were not allowed for fear of antagonizing the government. Knistedt tried farming, then briefly moved to Sao Paulo, but eventually returned to Germany in 1912. But his native Germany was far worse. 
It had become a barrack society engulfed in rank chauvinism and a blind, corpse-like obedience, as Knistad put it. He went back on the, on the lecture circuit, calling on workers to refuse to become murderers in the service of the state and instead support a general strike to stop the war mania. On January 27, 1913, the emperor's birthday, Knistadt spoke at one of the largest demonstrations of the unemployed in German history, but surveillance again led to arrest and jail time. In assessing his recent transatlantic experience, Knistadt now saw Brazil as a land where some freedom still prevailed without any of the follow-the-leader mentality. Brazil could be a land of the future. And so the family once again emigrated to Brazil. I left Europe, Knistadt later wrote, knowing that I had done my duty to prevent war to the best of my ability and with all my might. Knistadt sailed from Amsterdam. Two days later, Germany declared war on Russia. This time around, Knistadt settled not in the wilderness, but in Porto Alegre, the capital city of the southernmost state of Rio Grande do Sul, where he lived among German-Brazilian workers and became a leading member of the anarcho-syndicalist Socialist German Workers Association. War and revolution at home shook the lives of other German anarchists. While Knistadt left for Brazil, Rudolf Rocker returned to Germany after the war to help revive the anarcho-syndicalist movement. Knistadt's friend Erich Musam was released from prison, but Landauer, with whom he had shared the stage, met a gruesome end at the hands of right-wing militias. The political and ideological tensions of the Weimar Republic could be felt in the diaspora communities, including in southern Brazil, where Knistadt emerged as a major figure in the Brazilian labor movement. From 1920 to 1930, he edited the anarchist paper Der Freie Arbeiter, or The Free Worker, the only German-language anarchist periodical in the Americas at the time and he opened an international bookstore. In this capacity, he attacked racial chauvinism while promoting the radical humanist traditions. In 1925, for example, he ridiculed conservative Germans in Porto Alegre for celebrating the Kaiser's birthday seven years after his abdication. At the start of the 1930s, Knistadt seemed to withdraw from the movement when he was approached by an entrepreneur who offered him a broom factory, but in the end, he refused to engage in the exploitation of labor. Meanwhile, Nazi elements grew more active in Brazil, even before they took power in Germany. Brazil was in fact fertile ground for fascists seeking to influence the Italian and German communities there, especially after the populist autocrat Getulio Vargas came to power in 1930. The Brazilian police tolerated Nazi groups who were incorporated into the Nazi party's foreign organization. When in 1932 brown shirts attempted to take over a mutual aid society of which Knistadt was a board member, the anarchists fought back and won. Knistadt became the leading figure in the movement of anti-Nazi Germans. He and others founded the League for Human Rights' Porto Alegre chapter, which initially consisted of all kinds of leftists but ended up an anarchist group. They launched the paper Action, with Knistadt as editor and a circulation of 9,000, of which 3,000 were sent to Germany. This paper became the only anti-Nazi organ in Brazil and a counterweight to Nazi-friendly German-language newspapers and thus stood in direct confrontation with fascism. Nazi activists in Brazil continued to harass and intimidate and they had some success infiltrating German-language schools and cultural associations. Knistadt reported on incidents where the anarchist ideal of self-determination roundly defeated such bullying. For example, 
when Nazis infiltrated the Gymnastics Federation, the largest German-Brazilian organization in Porto Alegre. Angry members organized and ousted the Nazis at the next general meeting. The anti-fascist newspaper Axion also became a target when Nazi activists accused its editor of libel or of being a communist, charges that usually got the police involved. Again, Knistadt won two libel cases and relaunched his paper twice under different titles. Aktion was a threat to Nazis because it exposed lies and was one of the few outlets reporting on the crimes of the Third Reich. In 1937, Nazi intimidation reached his own family when he learned that his son Max had been forced to join the German Labour Front, a Nazi group, for fear of losing his job. Knistadt himself, now in his 60s, was arrested and jailed numerous times, which made him a known figure in Brazil. In 1934, Knistadt had an opportunity to tell the Nazi regime directly how he felt. When the Nazi foreign minister revoked his citizenship and that of 27 other German exiles, Knistadt replied that he was honored by the decision. I consider myself an opponent of this state, he wrote. I consider it my duty to do what I've always done, namely to tell the truth and and act accordingly. He declared himself stateless citizen of the world. Even though he celebrated Brazil's pluralism, he wasn't eager to naturalize. In 1936, he declared that if Brazil would ever deny the right of asylum to citizens of the world, he would pack his bags and find another place. Meanwhile, Rudolf and Millie Rocker had made it to the United States in 1933, where he lectured on the dangers of nationalism, antisemitism, and an impending world war. Rocker believed that about half of all German Americans supported Hitler. The Rockers also felt stateless, but the constant uncertainty of their visa status caused great anxiety, and it illustrates how tone-deaf American immigration policy was in the face of an impending humanitarian disaster in Europe, especially for Jews. When the United States and Brazil went to war with Germany, both Rocker and Knistadt announced their support for the Allies. This was a reversal of their previous anti-war stance in 1914, but now both made the same argument in favor of support, which provoked criticism from some anarchists. For Rocker, it was not so much about conserving bourgeois democracy, but about preserving what he called the possibilities of free development. For Knistadt, an allied victory would preserve the possibility of a new labor movement and some of the democratic rights and freedoms. In a 1943 interview, Knistadt clarified what the movement of anti-Nazi Germans stood for, an agreement with the Casablanca Declaration that demanded unconditional surrender without unjust punishment for the German people, repudiation of racism and anti-Semitism, the union of all free Germans, an appeal to German POWs to join the movement, building aid societies to help fugitives, and a salute to the South American people who had welcomed free Germans. In 1945, Rocker and Knistadt, both aged 72, helped set up an aid campaign for anarchist victims of fascism, together with Helmut Rüdiger, a 42-year-old anarchist exile in Sweden. It is a remarkable fact that a decentralized anti-fascist movement led by anarchists and non-partisan leftists was able for so long to resist Nazism by way of the printed word and peaceful direct action. The Brazilian historian René Gertz has remarked that the strength of this anarchist-led movement in Brazil was significant given the fact that it sustained a journalistic and organizational infrastructure for 20 years. Even Nazi elements in Brazil realized that this counter-movement was rather effective and could not be ignored. 
it should be clear that Knistadt and Rocker were not pacifists. They were militant anti-militarists, telling us that when it comes to fascism, we cannot turn the other cheek. They could not prevent global wars, but they did inspire and preserve local autonomies. Thank you for listening. To help others find Anarchist Essays, please rate and review us wherever you find your podcasts. And if you're interested in anarchist ideas, why not check out the journal Anarchist Studies? For over 20 years, Anarchist Studies has been publishing original research on the history, theory, and practice of anarchism. For more information, visit www.lwbooks.co.uk forward slash anarchist studies.